When GoGo 13 hit the NES back in 1988, it was a huge deal. It brought a super agent character that was unknown here in the US packaged in a game that combined different playstyle elements and an intriguing storyline that included an assassination, double crosses, an evening encounter, and the most egregious of all, smoking. Lots and lots of smoking. However, what we didn't know here in the US is that Golgo 13 was, and still is, one of the most prominent and ongoing manga series in Japan, having started all the way back in 1968 and is still being published to this very day. To give you an idea how successful this manga is, as of 2021, Golgo 13 has sold over 31 million copies of its manga worldwide. So it was only a matter of time before Golgo 13 landed on a video game home console. The Sega SG-1000 was the initial starting point for this, but it was the NES that brought the Golgo 13 character to the West and popularized him here in the States. And even then, we knew nothing about him. A cold-blooded spy, assassin, and chain smoker with ice in his veins and eyesight to make an eagle jealous. Golgo 13 was, is, and will always be a true badass. Many out there are familiar with the NES title Gogo 13 Top Secret Episode. That's the one that most of us played out there. But not many played the sequel to the spy thriller titled The Mafat Conspiracy. So the game was released in mid-1990 and was developed by ICOM, which were not the same developers from the first game. However, both of them were published by Vic Takai. Now, is that a good or bad thing? Well, let's find out. A terrorist group known as the Mafat Revolutionary is threatening the KGB and the CIA after a weapon satellite is taken from low Earth orbit using a type of satellite capturing technology and are now demanding the USA give up a nuclear sub and the USSR their research on electromagnetic waves or more satellites will be captured from orbit. Duke Togo aka Gogo13 is tasked with finding the head of this organization, neutralizing the target saving Dr. Barrows, who created the satellite capturing technology, and to destroy that technology in the process. A real change of pace from saving a princess from a mushroom kingdom back in the day, if you ask me. The game once again combines different game styles into one whole package. You got your standard 2D side-scrolling levels, the 3D mazes, a new driving segment, and of course, sniping. Gone is the first person shooting scenes that were triggered in the first game by surprise confrontations. Also gone are the flying shooting stages that I actually really liked and the underwater sections, which I found to be pretty cool in changing the scenery from time to time in the game. When you start, you're gonna see the screen right here which shows Gogo 13 shooting a skeleton. Now, when you first look at it, it seems very out of place until you realize that the developers were paying homage to the first Gogo 13 animated film titled Gogo 13 The Professional. So after watching the movie, this scene right here now made perfect sense to me. You start with no gun, but quickly get your hands on one. A big change from the first game is that you now have cutscenes similar to those found in the Ninja Gaiden games. Unlike before, where people would approach you from a semi first person view with a conversation text box showing the character's face up close. Not gonna lie, I kinda like the original text screens more. It gave it a more up close feel as if you were playing an actual anime flick. The biggest change here, however, are the graphics. A vast, and I'm talking vast, improvement over the original graphics. Here is a side-to-side -side comparison of both games. By 1990, the developers were very well acquainted with the NES technology and pushed out some impressive titles late in the life of that console. The Mafat Conspiracy falls into that category. Now granted, the 3D style mazes still look very lifeless. Luckily, the 2D levels are full of lots of details for an NES game. In one stage, you even got parallax scrolling while battling bad guys on top of a moving train. Not bad. And unlike the first game where you have a lot of people just walking by you and some of them might seem innocent and won't do anything to you, everybody you come across in this game is an enemy. This is also a game that rewards you for keeping the manual intact. That's because a few mazes of the game are already printed out to help you advance without having to draw your own map. That means if you rented this game, you were most likely already at a disadvantage since most rental games back then came with no manuals. The first game's manual also had a couple of maps printed out as well. Controls here are a bit more tight and responsive than the previous title. The jumping here is much more refined as opposed to part 1 and that floaty and somewhat delayed controls for it. You jump and kick slash shoot. 
The enemies drop plenty of ammo, so the only real challenge here is getting to the end without running into enemy fire, or falling down a pit, or a little bit of both. If not enemy fire, then enemy projectiles that blow up and hit you with shrapnel will kill you too. There's also a bit of platforming here, so jumping here is paramount. Actually, far more than it was on the first title. Not sure whose idea it was to make Gogo jump as if he was on the moon. Jumping in this game is a bit mm, more realistic here. Okay, barely. When you enter certain doors, the game shifts to the mace mode, which differs from part 1, which would have you enter into a conversation with an NPC. Only time you talk to an NPC in this title is between levels during cutscenes. The maze portion I feel is a little bit slower than part 1. There are also more enemies present and no laser beams or the dreaded pits where you fall down one level. Oh, those were the worst. Now, one thing Gogo is known for is... This game also has a very early sniping scene in the game where you go up against a military chopper. And I think we all know who wins here. Hint, the game isn't called Chopper 13. The driving segment is very basic even for an NES game. You got a timer here and you need to get through within that time frame or you start from the beginning again. Your car has three gears and you will need to learn when to change gears to maximize speed and complete the run as fast as possible. Your car has no brakes either. So if you press down, you go down a gear. If you press the B button, you throw a grenade, which is great for getting cars out of the way. They are unlimited, so go crazy here. The music in the game is actually a mixture. You got some upbeat tunes for the 2D levels and a more dreadful thriller type tune for the maze parts of the game. I would say some of the music here is quite memorable, but the problem is I don't think many people played this back in the day, myself included. But if I was to talk about good music in some old NES titles, the Mad Fact Conspiracy would be in that conversation. One big change in the game from the first one is that there are now actual boss encounters. I feel in part 1 the maze themselves and the whole pain of traversing them took the place of battling bosses and made the game feel longer than it actually was. Once you are in a boss battle, you don't have access to your gun, so punches and kicks are your only weapons. You also quickly realize that the game now feels more like a one-on-one -on -one fighting game. So while playing this part, pressing up now makes you jump. Hey, just like Street Fighter. So, what happened here? Why don't people talk much about this title, yet part 1 is usually brought up quite often? Well, let's start with 1. When the game was released, which was 1990. Now, that was a time when Nintendo might have still been on top of the world, but the Genesis and the TurboGrafx-16 were blowing away gamers with the next generation of graphics and in-game presentations. Think about it. In 1990, we had games like Strider, E-SWAT, Superstar Soldier, Fantasy Star 2, Alien Crush, Castle of Illusion, and Air Buster, to name a few. More and more gamers had their eyes on the new generation. So games like the Mad Fact Conspiracy just came out a little bit too late. Had it been a year earlier, maybe it would have garnered more attention. And even if you weren't into the 16-bit era yet, you still had games like Super Mario 3, DuckTales, Dracula's Curse, Super C, Fantasy Star on the Sega Master System, and other games with more appealing histories to entice players. I like to think the title itself played a role as well. The box only had the Mad Fact Conspiracy title on the front part of the box cover. But remember that you went into a store like Toys R Us, you literally had a wall of NES games one side to the other to choose from. That meant hundreds of titles at your disposal. You had to grab the attention of kids kids, mind you. Your first task as marketing is to put something that will grab the kid's attention without reading up on it or checking the back cover. That is what the front cover is for. So taking the Gogo 13 part out of the front part of the box leaves you with a weird title that not many would be interested in. Sounds like a boring spy thriller novel that your parents would probably read. 2. The actual cover art. Sure, it looks nice. If it was a Dean Kuntz novel, it would have helped to put, oh, I don't know, Gogo 13 anime art into a game about Gogo 13. Here, let me give you an example. Here's a cover that I cooked up. See? Tell me that wouldn't catch your eye as a kid. 
3, the actual game itself. If you had rented the game back in the day, being curious after seeing it on a store shelf, you might come back just a tad disappointed. The graphics, they're top notch, and the music is great, but the game feels very constrained. The levels are extremely short with slight platforming here and there. Every level here is a straightforward left to right or right to left scrolling experience. Extremely limited when you think that at the same time, you had other games with multi-level scrolling, horizontal and vertical levels, bonus stages, overhead stages, maybe had they added some shooting stages like in part 1? I mean that would have added some more gameplay to the mix. Granted, it does add a driving section but even it feels very dumbed down and offers very little in terms of gameplay or challenge. The mazes are smaller and that is a good thing, but it can't save the overall game's shortcomings. There is no menu screen of any type in the game. Gogo 13 is a spy. It would have been nice to offer the player cool gadgets and different weapons to choose from to complete missions. Same for the car segment. As it stands, the game is not that bad. It is not great, but it does offer some enjoyment when playing it. Plus, as a Gogo 13 fan, you have very little to look forward to when it comes to video games. The NES and SG-1000 games are the only action-oriented video games out there to choose from. I mean sure, there were two arcade games made in the late 90s, but they are light gun style games with very limited gameplay. You would figure an iconic character, such as Gogo 13, being a spy and all, would have a plethora of games under his belt. Yet, that is not the case. There was an LCD game released in early 1982 and then the last Gogo 13 title was on the DS in 2009, which turns out is only a trivia game mixed with some short mini games. That was only in Japan. The most badass assassin in the anime world reduced to mostly trivia. Ugh, oh, what a waste. What are your thoughts on this title? Should there be a new Gogo 13 game or has his time passed? Should he... I don't know, retire? Share your thoughts and see you on my next video. Until then, keep watching and keep gaming. series on games that time has forgotten. If you are new to the channel, welcome. If you are a subscriber, welcome back. This month, Legendary Wings.